Thanks for coming along tonight where Father Frank Brennan makes a, a welcome return to the, Sydney, to the Sydney Institute. He's been here on many occasions and, and we always like to have him back. Now this time on the occasion of the publication An Indigenous Voice to Parliament, Considering a Constitutional Bridge, which is really hot off the press. I think our copies arrived yesterday. Now I'll introduce our speaker very briefly, uh, except people have taken my notes. Um, well, he's uh, the principal of Newman College. He's a Jesuit priest, a lawyer, an author, and more besides. And the topic of tonight's speech is Le a legal light, watertight, indigenous voice to parliament. Frank Brilling, you're very welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and great to be with you. And thank you very much for the invitation, Jared and Anne. And I join with you in acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. So as you've heard, I'm going to speak on a legal, light, watertight, indigenous voice to parliament. Where am I coming from? I am a strong supporter of having a voice in the constitution. Why? because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders have said to us for some years, we think that is the only way in which we can be appropriately recognised. And I believe in self-determination to the extent of saying, well, there's no point in trying to recognise people in a way that they don't want to be recognised. With my Irish ancestry, I might say to myself, if I was setting out for Dublin, I wouldn't be setting out from here. But this is the stack of cards we've been dealt as a nation, that we think putting a voice into the Constitution is the way to go. If it's to be achieved, then that voice has to be proved to be workable, by which I mean it has to be proved not to clog the system of government, it has to be proved not to be a lawyer's picnic, and it has to be proved to be something which can contribute to the life and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So that's the challenge. Some of you will remember that I was here in 2015 when I launched my book, No Small Change, The Road to Recognition for Indigenous Australia. I was privileged that night to be joined by Professor Megan Davis. This was after the expert panel had reported in 2012 where they had recommended a racial non-discrimination clause to be put into the Constitution. Those of us who had been involved in the two native title debates, post Marbo and post Wick, knew that there was no way that a racial non-discrimination clause in the Constitution could fly. Because the most heated debates that occurred during both native title debates was the relationship between the Racial Discrimination Act on the one hand and the Native Title Act on the other. And at the end of the day, both Keating and Howard as Prime Ministers had to be able to guarantee the certainty of titles for minors and pastoralists, while at the same time acting graciously towards the recognition of Indigenous title. There is no way that could have been maintained with a one-line entry of racial non-discrimination in the Australian Constitution. I think I proved that in this book, but where I failed spectacularly was this. I said that I thought the lesson of the 1967 referendum was that a referendum which was symbolic, and you might say minimalist, but which was carried overwhelmingly by the Australian people, was the surest way to get real policy change. And that's what we got in Australia after 1967. But that argument carried no suasion whatever with the key Indigenous leadership. So once again, out of deference to self-determination, I say, well, that argument fails. So much for no small change. So we then came to the history of what we've been dealing with. And we've had the situation where you would be aware that for many years there was discussion about putting a preamble in the Australian Constitution. And I've given you a handout there. I won't go through it in great detail, but you might remember that it was in 2007 here at the Sydney Institute that John Howard said, if re-elected, that he would move to put a preamble in the Constitution. 
That had been the basic discussion in Australia since about 1993, when the very esteemed Aboriginal leader, Loacher O'Donoghue, served on the Malcolm Turnbull Republic Advisory Committee for Paul Keating. And she put forward a proposed preamble from ATSIC. And so from 1993 to 2007, the discussion was about a preamble. We then had, as I indicated, the um, expert panel in 20 year, in which put forward the idea of a racial non-discrimination clause, and therefore it too had to sink without trace. In 2013, I think a significant event occurred, which has been long overlooked. And I think it was a tribute both to Julia Gillard as Prime Minister and Tony Abbott as Leader of the Opposition. They basically got together and agreed this was going nowhere, but we should try and salvage that which was common ground. And they passed the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander People's Recognition Act. And you can see the th three key clauses of that Recognition Act. I think it's a pity that they've been lost sight of. We then had a situation where a referendum council was set up. Abbott, as Prime Minister, had agreed that there would be a referendum council. When Turnbull became Prime Minister, he once again agreed with Shorten, as leader of the opposition, that there'd be a referendum council. But the change that was made was it was agreed that most of the resources would be dedicated towards Indigenous consultations and that basically the consultations with the rest of the Australian community would be done digitally. And what we're now suffering, I want to argue tonight, is that since 2017, most of the government resources and focus has been upon resourcing Indigenous Australians and keeping them in the tent with government in trying to find a way forward. I have great respect for the resourcing of Indigenous Australians in a referendum of this sort. But the thought that you will convince the other 97% of the Australian population to get on board if there hasn't been a formal process for their engagement, I think proves problematic. Now, after the Referendum Council, there was a joint select committee on constitutional recognition relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It was chaired by the very respected Senator Patrick Dodson and Julian Lisa, so co-chaired from both sides of Parliament. And members of that committee included Linda Burney and Mullandiri McCarthy, who are now respectively the Minister and the Assistant Minister for Indigenous Affairs. So that gives you something of the background. When I look back, and perhaps I've been involved in these things for too long now, but having been involved in the Keating native title exercise, the Howard native title exercise, Paul Keating, I think, had a very good line at the outset of the native title exercise post Mabo, And he used to repeat it often. He said, good policy will be good politics. And I think he was right. And in the context of a referendum, I add to that that I think good process is necessary to produce good policy, which might then produce good politics, which might then produce popular support. And my chief argument tonight is that the process we have at the moment has all but broken down, and we're seeing it in some of the very vindictive exchanges which are now being publicly made. Uh, inevitable because of a breakdown in process. Those of you who are here in 2015 might remember that Megan Davis concluded her remarks by saying this, debates around the adequacy and the completeness of our constitution in today's environment are useful and they can contribute to a debate not only about Australia's past and present, but about the future of Australia. The process is about all of us, she said but it does call into question the response of non-Indigenous Australians who equally have not been given a chance to participate. It's not enough to leave the burden at Indigenous leaders' feet. And I think that is now the situation we're confronting. Let me, at the outset on questioning process, 
put myself very much in the shoes of Prime Minister Albanese and with great sympathy and, I might say, support. Uh, basically, Albanese came in as Prime Minister with a commitment to having a referendum. What did he confront? He confronted a Liberal Party which had had three Prime Ministers in a row who said, no, we will not stand for a voice being placed in the Constitution. Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison. And so question, what to do? He's freshly elected, he goes to Ghana and he announces a set of words and you have them there on your sheet. And he says that this set of words is a conversation starter, but as time goes on, it seems that these are words that are all but set in stone. Or to put it another way, what then happens is that it's decided that there will be three groups set up, a referendum working group of 21 Indigenous leaders, uh, a consultative group of 60 Indigenous leaders, and an eight-member cons uh, constitutional advisory group. And two key Indigenous leaders, Noel Pearson and Megan Davis, are on all three committees. Now, if we go back and look at the provenance of the Gama proposal, we know from the Boyer lectures that Noel Pearson said that Megan Davis, Pat Anderson and myself submitted a more streamlined draft that omitted the tabling procedure of the earlier draft to the Lisa Dodson Joint Select Committee in 2018. This provision drafted by Davis becomes the basis for the words now proposed by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. So basically what Albanese took was a fine-tuned version of a formula of words that had been put forward by those three key Indigenous leaders. My concern about process is this. The Joint Select Committee in November 2018 having received that submission, chaired by Dodson and Lisa, with Bernie and McCarthy as members, said this. The fact that there are so many different provisions proposing to constitutionalise the voice and that a new provision was suggested in a late submission received by the committee on the 3rd of November 2018, nearly two months after submissions had closed, indicates that neither the principle nor the specific wording of provisions to be included in the Constitution are settled. More work needs to be undertaken to build consensus on the principles, purpose and the text of any constitutional amendments. Now, we then were presented with the Gama formula and then were presented with a situation where we were told that eventually there would be a parliamentary committee set up where people could make submissions and where the coalition could put forward their views. But in the meantime, what is to happen? It was for that reason I allowed things to lapse for three months, but after Gama, three months on, early November, I wrote to the Prime Minister and I said, look, I think you need to set up a parliamentary committee. Why? because citizens generally need to be able to participate in this process and there is a need for the coalition to be at the table. Well, here we are, almost another four months on, and we're now told there will be a parliamentary committee set up at the end of next month, end of this month. So there's going to be another month of hemorrhaging uh, while we have this playing out about the actual formula of words. What we then had in the Gama formula was the critical second sentence. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to Parliament and the Executive Government on matters related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. My approach to this matter was informed by an image created by Noel Pearson back in January 2022 where he came up with the idea of the hook, which I thought was a very good idea. And back in January 2022, speaking on the ABC, he spoke of a blueprint for a legislative, legislative voice 
and the need for a new constitutional hook on which we can hang the structure of the voice. So my approach has been to say, right, how do we design that hook to go in the Constitution, which could win the support of the Australian public and win the support of Indigenous leadership? And with that hook, what then might be the possibilities in terms of future legislation for what you might put on that hook? What has become problematic, as you'll be aware, is the addition of these words, executive government. If you look at the primary recommendation of the Referendum Council in 2017, there was no mention of executive government. It was exclusively the recommendation speaking of a voice to parliament. But all of a sudden, it became a voice to parliament and executive government. Now, I'm speaking specifically on this tonight in part because I take very seriously the report the other day of Professor Megan Davis in the Gandhi oration that she gave at the University of New South Wales. Now, this was reported by Paige Taylor at The Australian. Now, it's important to understand, yes, there might be some reporters at The Australian who are quite hostile to The Voice or whatever. Paige Taylor is known to be an accurate and empathetic reporter of the key Indigenous leaders within News Limited. So someone like myself, and I'm assuring that people like yourselves, can usually accept what Paige Taylor says as being the statements of these key Indigenous leaders. So as reported by Paige Taylor at the Gandhi oration, uh, it was said that the Indigenous voice will have a lot of power and will not passively wait to be consulted, Megan Davis says. Quote, there is a misconception that it will have no power and it will have no influence. I mean, we can debate that for ages, but of course it will have a lot of power. It will have a lot of power because it's a constitutional voice that is mandated by the Australian people, and that gives it a lot of power. The work of the voice is to provide representations to the parliament and the government of the day, and currently the proposed amendment is that it's up to the voice to determine what is important to it. It will make the representations, so it's not a consultative body in that it's sitting there waiting passively for the Commonwealth to consult it or bureaucrats to consult it. It's a very active voice and it can make representations on the issues that it sees are relevant and important to First Nations peoples. So, Let's unpack what might be the five discrete functions of a voice to parliament and executive government. Bear in mind that executive government is a technical term that appears in the Australian Constitution. It doesn't just include ministers of government, it includes basically every Commonwealth public servant. And arguably, it includes people who are members of Commonwealth agencies. Now, I had no idea about this until preparing for this talk. I looked up on the government website. Do you know how many government departments and government agencies there are for the Commonwealth? Could anyone guess? 80. Hmm? 80. 189. So, what then are the five discrete functions of the voice to Parliament and Executive? First, to Parliament in relation to special laws. That is, laws under 5126, laws which are made in relation to the people of a particular race, namely Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, for whom it is deemed necessary to make special laws. Now, I am a strong advocate of saying, if you're going to put anything in the Constitution about a voice, it should be that the voice is consulted and has to be consulted in relation to special laws which are made under 5126. Second function would be to Parliament in relation to all manner of other laws. How do you say that a law does not relate to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in 21st century Australia? In fact, how dare anyone suggest that a particular law has nothing to do with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians if it is a law which has something to do with all the rest of us? Third, a voice to ministers in relation to policies and proposed laws. Fourth, 
to public servants in relation to administrative decisions which affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander citizens, and fifth, to persons who work under statute in any part, arm, organ or agent of the executive government, including ASIO, ASIC, the Royal Commission, the AAT, perhaps even the Reserve Bank. Now, what I want to suggest this evening is that to constitutionalise this function is a very big ask, in that what we're talking about here is the creation of a new entity in the Australian constitutional framework, namely a voice in which I, of which I am in favour, and that it would have a specific constitutional function in relation to special laws made under 5126. I'm even open to the idea of having a voice that indeed would make representations to executive government. But I would thought, given the complexity of government, that you would do that by statute if for no other reason that if you encounter unexpected problems, that Parliament can rectify them. But what's being proposed here is a one-line entry in the Australian Constitution which gives a constitutional entity a constitutional entitlement to make representations. Now, I ask you, do this thought experiment. You're a public servant doing your day-to-day -day job. You say, I'm about to make a decision which may impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons. The voice has a constitutional entitlement to make representations to me. What is expected of me? What is my constitutional duty? Should I be required to give notice to the voice that I'm thinking of making a decision about a particular matter? so that you, the voice, will be able to make a representation to me? And if so, what will be my obligation in relation to responding to that representation? Will it be exactly the same as what it would be if it were created by statute? Or is there the chance that the High Court might say, this is something very sacred. This is a constitutional duty which has been imposed in relation to a constitutional entity on all public servants. I want to suggest to you that this is somewhat equivalent, though I think bigger, than the major Commonwealth administrative law reforms that occurred in Australia in the 1970s, with the setup of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, the institution of the Ombudsman, etc. It took some years, and I think they were good developments, basically, to get the Commonwealth bureaucracy more administratively accountable. What then is required for the Commonwealth bureaucracy to become administratively accountable to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander aspirations if you constitutionalise the voice? Another problem is this. It's all very well to speak of representations to Parliament. Uh, they would be open and transparent. Presumably, they would be tabled in Parliament or they might be given to the Speaker or the President. But what about representations made to executive government? To whom would they be presented? Maybe we just drop hundreds or thousands of them each week to the Governor-General. Or is each Minister of the Crown to receive all representations in <coughs> relation to his or her department? Or is each department to set up a unit within itself, which may be a very good idea, who can process the representations received and can give advice to public servants as to how to operate in administering their services in order to ensure that the voices give an adequate gnosis in order that representations might be made. You can see that these are indeed very big questions. So I think where we're at in terms of process at the moment is that government has decided that they will run with the Gama words, which include this being a voice to parliament and to executive government.
Clearly, there's been a difference of viewpoint expressed within the Constitutional Working Group as to whether or not this is problematic. I, being a strong advocate of the voice, uh, I do not apologise for publicly saying I think it is highly problematic. And basically, if you're trying to design a hook to get into the Constitution, namely a voice, why, in God's name, would you be trying to create this operation which would have such extraordinary impact on the running of bureaucracy? So what we've got now is a process where there's the 21-member referendum working group, the 62-member First Nations referendum engagement group, and the eight-member eight constitutional expert group. They basically work in confidence, but they issue the occasional communique. Uh, the communiques even from the constitutional expert group, they're not very long legal documents. I suppose they're designed to be accessible to ordinary members of the public. We're now told that the Constitutional Alteration Bill will be brought in in late March and that it will contain the proposed words to be put into the Constitution. Now, usually we arrive at proposed words to put in the Constitution after a People's Constitutional Convention or after some parliamentary committee process. What we've been treated to is being told, well, look, we're working it out with these confidential groups, but Peter Dutton's got my phone number, or I've met with Peter Dutton six times. Well, I just don't think that's the way you amend the Australian Constitution. So what's essential, of course, is that there be, with this parliamentary committee, uh, proper processes and to hear from relevant people. In my remaining four minutes, I'd like to suggest the way forward on that. First, and most essential, I think will be to hear from key heads of government departments. And I'm going to be very bold on this tonight. We've all come through robo-debt. We've all had enough of senior public servants simply doing their master's bidding, no matter what the cost. Now, it is said by the new government, we don't want that. OK, if you're going to have a voice to executive government, which will have a constitutional function of making representations, where the public servants will then have a constitutional duty, then please, we need to hear from the head of the Department of Social Services, the head of the Department of Health and Aged Care, the head of the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations, the head of the Department of Education, and the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And they just need to be upfront with us. Tell us how long will it take to adjust the bureaucracy to receive these representations? What processes do they envisage in order to accord natural justice to the voice in giving notice that they're thinking of making decisions and receiving representations? Second thing, we must receive and publish opinions from the Solicitor General. With all respect for the Constitutional Expert Group, what's been produced from them just doesn't pass muster. Now, I respect, you know, there's a retired High Court judge and very fine legal academics. I chaired the National Human Rights Consultation for the Rudd Government. This wasn't about amending the Australian Constitution. This is about talking about whether or not there'd be a statutory bill of rights. This report contains 30 pages of advice from the Commonwealth Solicitor General about the legal questions which we appropriately raised as a committee. If you can do that for a national human rights consultation, you must do it if you are going to envisage amending the Australian Constitution by putting a new entity in the Constitution which changes the relationships between executive and the citizens and arguably also the High Court and its citizens. So if we could get that frank and fearless advice, we might move forward. I'll conclude with my suggested amendment to the Australian Constitution, and you have it there at the end of the sheet. Though I do note 
that of late there's an increased appetite among some of the Indigenous leadership for getting bolder words of recognition into the Constitution. Part of the problem we've had for the last year or two is all the eggs have been put into the voice basket. But now, understandably, there's a call that, well, there are things we actually want to recognise about Indigenous history, about Indigenous reality, about Indigenous hope and aspirations. So here's my bold suggestion, which I intend to put to the Parliamentary Committee, and you're hearing it for the first time here. Why not insert at the beginning of the Constitution, not a preamble, so you don't have the Conservatives worried about whether it informs other parts of the Constitution, but just Chapter 1A of the Australian Constitution. It would read as follows. It would be headed, The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples. The people of the Commonwealth, one, recognise that the continent and the islands now known as Australia were first occupied by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Two, acknowledge the continuing relationship of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with their traditional lands and waters. Three, acknowledge and respect the continuing cultures, languages and heritage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, there shall be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice with such structures and functions as the Parliament deems necessary to facilitate consultation prior to the making of special laws with respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and with such other functions as the Parliament determines. If Parliament wants to give it a role in relation to general laws dealing with Parliament, fine. If Parliament wants to give them additional roles in terms of dealing with the executive government on particular issues, fine. If Parliament wants to distinguish and say, look, you can have a role in dealing with ministers in terms of policy or designing legislation, but not in terms of dealing with public servants on routine administrative decisions, then fine. We need the flexibility. What's proposed is too fixed, too simplistic, it won't fly, and I don't think the Australian public would ever accept it. Thank you. Well, many, many thanks to uh, Frank Brennan, who I should have said at the start is also a professor at the Thomas More Law School at the ACU. And so um, before we come to questions and discussion, just a reminder... There are copies of an Indigenous voice to Parliament considering a constitutional bridge that are on sale tonight and um, will be on sale online. And I'm sure our speaker will be happy to sign them before he goes. So if you just come back here um, and we'll start off. Um, I'll be running the microphone on this part of the room here and we'll do the two thirds of the room there. Um, and everyone's got to keep their comments brief, a bit like this. Um, I can remember this, the 67 referendum quite well, believe it or not. And what I remember about it really was there wasn't, it was all very simple and there wasn't really even a campaign, certainly in the state of Victoria, because most of the debate was on the nexus about whether you change the relationship of numbers between the Senate and the House of Representatives. That was the big issue. There were splits in the Liberal Party. Uh, there was, um, the, it was bipartisan support, but a lot of opposition and it. As you know, it went down. But the other one sailed through because it was all so simple and there really wasn't a debate. But what I'm noticing now is that there are now increasingly debates within people who are pro-voice and then indigenous people who are anti-voice and others as well. So in this kind of complexity, what's, is there any way out of this complexity? Well, as I've suggested tonight, Jared, I think the complexity has been created because of the process that was adopted from July until now. And I think it was inevitable that hostilities would break out. Uh, we Australians were very egalitarian, we're very democratic. And amending our constitution is very difficult. And the Labor Party record on it is appalling. Uh, that's not to blame the Labor Party, it's to say that if you look at Australian politics, of course if the Liberal Party is proposing a change to the constitution, Labor's more than likely to be aboard. But the contrary does not stand in relation to if Labor puts forward a proposal. So Labor has made 25 attempts to amend the Australian Constitution and has failed 24 times. 
And I know there's no one in this room who participated in the successful Labor Party referendum. How do I know that? Because you actually have to be 97 years of age. <laughs> and it was a referendum in relation to things like child endowment and maternity allowances, things which would apply to everybody. What we're talking about here is something quite distinctive. So in order to retrieve that, what I'm suggesting is, all right, we've got another month of hemorrhaging to go on, but once that parliamentary committee is set up, there cannot be a legitimate expectation that whatever the words that are put forward will be the words that will go in the Constitution. In a sense, it's the starting point of the conversation. Uh, from which we might then hear from a variety of people. I mean, sure, I'll put in my two bob's worth, but presumably so will lots and lots of other citizens. Now, it's being said at the moment that'll all be done in six weeks. Well, I say to myself, look, if the exclusive and fairly confidential Indigenous processes have run for, let's say, eight months by then, then to say to the public generally, look, you can do this in six weeks, I think is a big ask. So basically the question is going to be, uh, do we have a constitutional convention? Probably not. But do we have a long running parliamentary committee process where, as I say, we not only invite submissions, we not only have experts there at the table, uh, but where we do hear, particularly from the heads of government departments, if people are still adamant that the hook has to include uh, representations to executive government. Because if it does, then that's going to be one humongous hook. I've got a question, a couple here. I've got a question from our zoo. If a person of Aboriginal heritage is denied recognition by their community, which would affect their recognition rights, how are conflicts of interest addressed in determining to who gets to be part of the voice? Mm. Well, those questions are usually resolved by the threefold test of who is Aboriginal, which was basically set down in Mabo and has been accepted by courts and tribunals ever since. Uh, I would imagine if there be a dispute, then it would end up either in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or in court, uh, in that uh, it's not going to be a matter which can be resolved uh, definitively just by voice members themselves. I'm very excited to be here tonight and I have to ask a short question and I know that it's um, what I'm asking you is in shorthand but you'll understand. So in Mabo the court very carefully rejected the notion that by introducing native title that there was any issue with respect to sovereignty but that was reversed in love to some extent because what Justice Edelman was talking about was the natural incongruity between native title and alienability. And Justice Gagler warned in that decision that introducing a race-based implication into the Constitution was problematic for this question of sovereignty. Isn't you say that this what... is a short question? <laughs> <laughs> this is as short as I can make it, but, I mean, you understand. So that, I mean, introducing this, we are basing this on a race-based implication as to representations. Okay. For a group mm. of people that's inalienable, inalienable, what are we doing? Mm. Well, I think what we're doing, and I have followed Murray Gleeson on this with the splendid talk he gave in 2019, he having served on the Referendum Council, where, as I read him, he was confining himself to uh, a voice to Parliament. I know others have read Murray Gleeson as saying something different, but I find it very difficult to read that speech except in terms of a voice to Parliament. And he, I thought, made the very legitimate point that if in the 21st century we have a constitution where we say that the Commonwealth Parliament has power to make laws with respect to the people of a particular race for whom it's deemed necessary to make special laws, and when in the 21st century that applies only to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, then to insist on a formal uh, constitutional consultative device is only right and proper. And so I think that that can be cavilled from the Love and Thomas situation, Love and Tom's situation. Okay, so there's a question here. Um, got to speak into it. And got to be brief. Hang on, there. 
Thank you. Assuming the Prime Minister's uh, version of the question were to prevail, and the Mr. Speaker doesn't move. It's not turned on. Push it on. Okay. Down the front aisle. Yeah. It is on. Yeah, assuming that that's uh, adopted, is it conceivable that we could see a situation in which um, future nominees for positions such as the High Court could go through a, a question and answer interview process, mm. such as similar sorts of things happen in the United States? Mm. I, I can't rule it out. I'm not saying it would be ruled in. No. Um, I, I'm simply making the point that the, the strength of Professor Davis's Gandhi oration is basically putting us on notice that, look, this is to be a very powerful body and it will exercise its imperatives as to if and when to take action. Now, I mean, it may be conceivable that it would be argued that uh, because the High Court is governed by a High Court of Australia Act or whatever, <coughs> that the voice could make an intervention, and maybe that then would become the subject of litigation in the High Court. I just, I don't know. Uh, but it, it, it's that sort of, I mean, in terms of trying to get a referendum up, where you need a majority of voters in four of the six states, the last thing you want is uncertainty on these things. As I've often said, when I was writing No Small Change, I got to know Bob Ellicott quite well. And Ellicott was the most successful Attorney General in Australian history with referendums. He got three of the eight up. And he said the first rule always is you can't have anything in there which creates doubt or complexity. Well, all I'm suggesting tonight is that uh, representations to executive government, I think, creates a mountain of complexity and doubt. And I say... Why would you want to visit that upon yourselves in a referendum campaign? If you're trying to get that hook, the voice, into the Constitution, wouldn't you have something which is much more finely tailored and where then you would allow for Parliament to experiment, if it likes, in the future about what additional functions it might perform? First of all, uh, an excellent speech. It was very, very well uh, made and uh, very useful at this particular time. Um, and I liked your suggestion uh, as well, but uh, in the event that that doesn't fly for some reason, what do you think would be the possibility of success if we have to continue to use Albanese's wording in some fashion to, to make a slight change to it so that it would read... Um, uh, the, the, the voice may make representations to Parliament on matters especially relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, etc. Mm. Well, uh, I mean, that's, that's one option to look at, but clearly what it does is allow the voice at its own discretion to make representations to Parliament in relation to all laws which might be contemplated. It's got to be special, especially okay. though. Right. Okay. Okay. If your recommendations, which are very sensible, are rejected, then how will you advise this audience to vote? Uh, if, if you cannot separate the, the recommendation of the executive with the institution of something in, uh, pre in the preamble, uh, already a number of churches have advocated the yes vote without listening to your advocacy. Hmm. How would you recommend it if your recommendations okay. are rejected? Right. Well, I think, Michael, I mean, there are all sorts of groups out there, church groups, sporting groups, corporate groups or whatever, who are urging a yes vote. Uh, but clearly they don't yet know what they're asking people to vote yes to uh, because there is no proposition in existence that's been through the requisite processes. So what I would say is that uh, in terms of what I would advise people in terms of the constitutional referendum, I would wait until uh, the processes have run their course and we have a set of words. What I'm suggesting to you tonight, I'll be very surprised if the set of words that was announced at Gama 
will be the set of words that will emerge from the parliamentary committee and be put to the Australian public in that I think that set of words is so problematic that I think there would be so many people who had doubts and uncertainties that the prospect of getting a majority vote on them, I think, is very slight indeed. And I think the other thing to say is that bear in mind that we're dealing with a new government. They came in in May. The announcement was made in July about, you know, representations to executive government. By the time we get to the end of the parliamentary committee process in June, uh, the ministers, they'll have all been ministers for at least a year. And I think with some of them, it will start to dawn, do I actually want to run a government department where every public servant in my department has hanging over them the prospect that any decision they ever make has to be after receiving representations for which there is a constitutional mandate, and therefore that all of my public servants before they make decisions have to give the voice advance notice that they're thinking of making those decisions. I suspect there'll be a number of those ministers who will say, well, actually, we've come to the conclusion after a year in government that government is complex enough as it is, and furthermore, what's going to be the real benefit to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians by creating this new level of complexity within the Commonwealth bureaucracy, given that so many of the basic services which may alleviate the situation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians are not administered by the Commonwealth anyway, but by state governments. Uh, it reminds me, I've been around long enough to remember 1978. Uh, you might remember in my home state of Queensland, Joe B. Elke Peterson, a colourful Premier, Russ Hins, the Minister for Local Government, and Malcolm Fraser, with some gusto, said that the Commonwealth was going to go in and take over the reserves at Arakoon and Mornington Island when the Uniting Church was pulling out. And uh, Joe simply regazetted them as local government areas. And I remember a very senior Liberal Minister in Canberra saying to me, well, Frank, really, there's nothing more we can do because actually we don't provide the police, we don't provide the nurses, we don't provide the teachers. So in terms of this posited, uh, complex, new arrangement for the government bureaucracy, I think there'll be real questions as to what are the real benefits to come from this? There may be benefits over time if we do it in a statutory basis where it can be done incrementally and where we can learn by mistakes and where we can do it in terms of co-design, which is what is the buzzword in these things. I spent two years on the senior advisory group on co-design. Well, why not co-design something rather than simply having it constitutionally <laughs> mandated where the seven High Court judges say, this is what it shall be. Peter Graham, Father Brennan. Uh, may I ask a question about your draft section 127? Hmm. Uh, I guess the, the essence of the question is, can the parliament be trusted to correctly formulate the structure and functions of the voice? Hmm. Uh, a voice will be for keeps. It won't just be for one, the duration of one term of parliament. Uh, do we not need to know in the constitution whether it's going to be a constitutional corporation or an elected body? Mm. Do we need to know what the eligibility will be for service on it if it's elected? Do we need to know uh, whether or not what term of office will apply? Do we need to know what will be the eligibility of electors hmm. of people okay. to the voice? Right. I, think, okay. I think we get the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what that may come to is you need to know those things before you will vote yes. Do we need those things in the Constitution? No, I don't think we do. If you look at the Australian Constitution, it's a very spare document. And I would argue strongly if the constitutional function of the voice, the hook, 
were as confined as I have stipulated it, then the need for the Constitution to deal with all the other complexities about the voice doing all sorts of other things, that would not arise in the Constitution. It would be a matter for statute and for policy deliberation thereafter. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Brennan. Very clear. Everything is ter terrific. What's going to be the fallout if the referendum fails? Is it going to be catastrophic? What would, it, what do you think uh, lies ahead if that happens? Look, I, I think it's, it would be very hard times indeed for all of us, but particularly for uh, a lot of those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders who have invested so much in this. I mean, no one could have watched Noel Pearson on television the other night and not be moved by it that there are individuals, not just him, not just Megan Davis, not just Pat Anderson, that they've given their lives to this. Uh, but that's why I say it may be late in the day, but I thought the time had come to basically raise a clarion call and say, hang on, we've got to get the process more right than it has been, and we've got to get a formula of words which is more... Uh, consistent with the architecture of the Constitution and therefore more likely to win the support of the Australian people. And, uh, I mean, I sat down and I wrote the book in part because I wasn't going to write anything very much, but then you might remember back then in November or whatever when the government said they weren't going to publish a yes and a no case and the argument was offered that we live in a digital age. I found that very troubling indeed, in that uh, there are a lot of remote Aboriginal communities <coughs> where the idea that they just look it up on the computer rather than with a pamphlet that was left at their door, uh, I found that frankly offensive. And so one of the things, if I may say, that I'm proudest about in the book is that two of the three last chapters are the yes case and the no case. They're of equal length. I think it's a very ha fair-handed treatment. And I'd say 90% of the quotes in those two chapters are from Indigenous Australians. And I think it is absolutely essential that all of us as responsible voters be attentive to those Indigenous voices, stop the name-calling, and ensure that there can be more civil discourse as to the way forward. Now, if all of those things are done, I think it increases the prospect of getting to yes, for which I fervently hope. If we don't get to yes, yes, there will be a period of very profound mourning and upset for quite some time to come. Uh, but I think we're just going to have to work through that as a nation. And as Noel Pearson himself has said, it will be up to the next generation of leaders to give it a go. But I think we have it in us as a nation with the generation of Indigenous and other leaders that we've got to get this right now. And I think it's at least worth giving it a try. Uh, Frank, yesterday at a seminar I listened to a couple of Liberal politicians who are pro-voice, but they pointed out that the vote from non-Labor, or we take Liberal National, is about 11% in favour of the voice and that such voters are not emotive voters. And you're trying to get a question that will possibly convince those people. But there's also a lot of questions that nobody can answer. Mm. So how we go, like your statement mm. about the states, I made that statement yesterday. Mm. You, you've got most of the problems where we've got everyone saying this is going to solve Aboriginal mm. disadvantage, Aboriginal misery oh. in the outback, whatever. But they're all controlled by territories and states. Mm. How do you answer the questions that people are asking, even with a simple question? Mm. Because people are going to ask it, how is this going to make it any better for Aborigines? How can mm. we answer that? Mm. Well, I think it can be answered in two ways. One is to say, look, uh, all sides of politics since 2007 with John Howard have been trying to provide an answer to this question. And isn't it time we just put it behind us? Isn't it time we just got it right and moved on? Uh, 
or are we to say that everyone, including John Howard, got it wrong in saying that we need to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution? The second thing is to say that in terms of uh, the overall well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander citizens, everyone, including those who are the most unemotive Liberal Party conservative voters, acknowledge there's no substitute for people being involved in their own lives and in the delivery of services. And anything that can be done to maximise that for the better. See, I think part of the problem, Anne, is that, I mean, we had the demise of ATSIC, and I should say to this audience, I even heard it again at that seminar yesterday, it's intimated that somehow, you know, it was the mean and nasty John Howard who got rid of uh, ATSIC. I was sitting in the public gallery the day the leader of the opposition, Mark Latham, got up at question time and taunted Howard and said, when are you going to scrap ATSIC? And Rudd, who was a mate of mine, was sitting on the Labor front bench, looked up at me and went... <laughs> 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 but since ATSIC went, and it's become the mantra that, oh, well, we don't want anything which delivers services or which makes decisions about resource allocation. So then we move to the Congress of Australia's First People. Well, as I've often said, no disrespect to the people involved in the Congress, but if you're on a remote Aboriginal community, you know, trying to deal with day-to-day -day problems, and a member of the Congress turns up, the conversation goes something like this. Oh, so you're here to help us with our services? Oh, no, we don't do services. Oh, so you're going to help us with resource allocation? No, we don't do resource allocation. Oh, what do you do? Oh, we do advocacy. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy your trip home. So what we're involved in now is that we've had about a decade where there hasn't been a coherent national funnel, if you like. Uh, there's been the creation of the Coalition of Peaks, but, for example, uh, they were not eligible to attend the Uluru Dialogues. And so we haven't had that prospect of a national Indigenous organisation which can deal directly with government. And I think most people would accept that it would be sensible to have one. Just a final question, because we're right on time. So what do you... Um, what do you well, what would your advice be to our political leaders, particularly the Prime Minister and the opposition leader? I mean, what might they be doing to, to move the debate along in the manner that you're suggesting? I think, I mean, the challenge before Mr Albanese, and I think he's giving all his efforts to this, is to try and keep the key Indigenous leadership in the tent, while at the same time getting to a formula of words that can win uh, the majority of Australian voters. Now, I think uh, he should accelerate as far as possible the setup of a parliamentary committee process. He should make it clear that the words that are put forward in that bill really enjoy no more status than the words that he announced at Gama, that they are an invitation to treat for all members of our parliament and that Mr Dutton should be encouraged that once that parliamentary committee is established, that he uh, come clean, come straight, what is it we're prepared to support? And then work together on a formula of words which is seen to be the substantive minimal hook in the constitution, which can then be owned by the indigenous leadership together with both sides of politics. Many thanks. Well, thanks to Frank Brennan. I know there were more questions and comments here tonight. We always finish on time. As I said earlier, copies of Frank's book, An Indigenous Voice to Parliament, Considering a Constitutional Bridge. And we've had, and, and, and as, um, as Frank said, at the chapters eight and nine are from memory, I think it is, uh, seven and eight, canvas the yes case and the no, no case in a very objective manner. So, and that's what we've had here tonight, a very detailed talk about a complex issue explained in a simple manner, which is what we all want. Well done and good luck. Thank you.